Welcome to the second half of the Heartland Labor Forum. I'm Chris Mann, your host. The song you've heard was Praise for the Pandemic, written and read by Christine Paintner from the Abbey of the Arts. And the music was done by Giants and Pilgrims. The poem describes both isolation and death, but gives praise for those who are attempting to transcend isolation with love, kindness, care, and science. The Center for American Progress reported in an article, March 30th, 2020, the coronavirus pandemic is fueling fear and hate across America. They write, since the first report of COVID-19 on American soil, Asian Americans, especially Chinese Americans, have endured physical and economic abuse at the hands of their classmates, neighbors, and fellow citizens. Earlier this month, a woman was physically assaulted while walking to the subway. The article continues by saying that throughout US history, pandemics and epidemics have bred misinformation, hysteria, and scapegoating, ultimately leading to a surge in racial and ethnic discrimination. Tonight, our guest is Bob Grove, climate, a climate activist and president of the Climate Council of Kansas City. Bob will delve into the origin and causes of this devastating virus. Welcome, Bob. Hi, Chris. Thank you for taking the time. Oh, I'm happy to be here. Can you tell us why you were involved with climate change and what led you to this work? Why is well, it important to you? Absolutely. I mean, the climate and the environment has always been important to me. Um, you know, the outdoors and being part of nature. But in terms of work, you know, I've worked with a lot of nonprofits over the years, um, done a lot of social justice. In recent years, I've been working with the ACLU and I started working with the Sierra Club as their legislative chairman in Missouri. So that kind of got me engaged in the environmental community here in Kansas City. And what's unique about Kansas City, the greater Kansas City, is that we are a two-state city metropolitan area and I found limitations in working with um, groups that were state-based you know being able to work on one side of the state line but not another so I decided Kansas City needed a council that was able to work with groups on both sides of the state line and throughout the greater Kansas City area so that's what led to creating the climate council so what a great idea uh, not not, not uh, going by the strict borders of the states. That's perfect. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, so many of the, th so many of the things, the, the behavior changes affect the entire community. And I know I'm a person that lives a few blocks from the state line. I don't know where the state ends and stops. I mean, it's all one community yeah. to me. So having an organization that could um, address environmental issues and work with groups throughout the metro area just really made sense. So, what are the causes of COVID-19? How did this uh, begin? Should we be blaming one group of people or another? I, I don't think we should blame anybody but ourselves for situations like this. You know, we all contribute or we all stand up and make things better. So it does nobody any good to blame somebody else. It does not solve the problem. Um, climate change and pandemic, they kind of go hand in hand. Um, it's not so much that one causes the other, but they both have the same causes and they both have the same solutions. So as the, the climate crisis has accelerated, it's just created fertile ground for pandemics to accelerate and become more deadly. And we're seeing that right now. I mean, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Um, we're seeing increased pandemics in the last decade, and we can go into some details on those if you want. And at the same time, we're seeing increased weather disasters, which is the result of climate change. So really the same, um, same actions, the same causes are leading to these environmental changes that include pandemics. So can you go into more detail about what are the climate factors that are um, causing these pandemics? Absolutely, a big one is habitat destruction. And um, when, we, when we talk about that, we talk about deforestation. You know, we, we look at what's happening to the Amazon and Brazil. 
and other places. I mean, I don't want to pick on Brazil. There's a lot of places where we're dealing with habitat destruction. And what this basically does is it increases the interaction of wild animals and humans. And it reduces the habitat of wild animals, forcing them into a smaller area that promotes the transmission of um, zoonotic viruses. Um, zoonotic, interesting word. A, a zoonotic disease is a virus is transmitted from an animal to a human. So we're dealing with what are typically common flu bugs, cold bugs, you know, a cold, the sniffles, um, which are, are pretty benign when they're in their native species. But when that um, cold virus, which is a coronavirus, or that flu virus, which is the influenza, when that jumps to another species or to a human, we don't have immunity to those. So those become devastating pandemics to us. And that's what's happening. The habitat destruction um, does a couple things. Um, it um, produces what we call novel viruses and emerging viruses. So those are two different situations. An emerging virus is one that already exists in the wild, but because the wild habitat's being destroyed and those animals are moving into human habitated areas, suddenly those viruses are emerging from the wilderness where they were stable and now they're starting to infect humans and other animals. The other term you may heard, um, the novel coronavirus, and that means a mutated virus. And what happens there is a virus will go through a, um, a animal vector. So the, the COVID-19 we're looking at allegedly started with um, bats and then jumped to, they think, pangolins. And then within the pangolin, it was able to jump from that species to the humans. So most of the pandemics we've been looking at over the last century have been transmitted from their host where they're fairly benign to an intermediate species where they can mutate into a virus that can then affect humans. Um, some of the numbers, the National Institute of Health in 2013, they did a big study. They found that there's 320,000 unknown viruses in wild animals and that 80% of all the world's wild animal lives in forests. So you can just think about that. As we destroy the Amazon and other forests, we're driving these animals into smaller and smaller areas where they can vector their viruses to other species where they can then mutate, become novel viruses. And at the same time, moving these animals, forcing these animals to inner cities, um, you know, to start having closer contact with humans so that those zoonotic diseases can transfer to humans. So, um, so then as the forests diminish, the animals really have nowhere to go and then it makes it easier for the interaction between humans in uh, what are the called wet markets? What, what happens there? Wet markets and uh, you know, wet markets is a is opening the topic of animal agriculture, and you know that's also a factor that drives climate change. Uh, if you look at the EPA's charts, they they will show that um, animal agriculture is responsible for 14% of all greenhouse gas emissions. 14%. That's the same as all transportation. I mean, cars, shipping, planes, all transportation. Animal agriculture is just as devastating to the environment. So um, the wet markets are a form of animal agriculture. Here in the United States, we are uh, more likely to encounter CAFOs, commercial animal farming operations. Although we do have wet markets in New York and, and various large cities. A wet market is basically where you go and the animals are live. They're in cages. Um, it's like going to a grocery store, except the animals are live. You basically walk in, you point to that one, they take it into the back room and they butcher it. So you're getting incredibly fresh meat. Okay, that's good on the one hand. On the other hand, we're packing all of these live animals in very tight, small spaces. And if one of the animals is sick, if it's got a virus, if it's got a cold, a coronavirus, or if it's got the flu, an influenza virus, that virus is gonna be more likely to jump to another species because that species is sitting on a table right next to the sick animal. 
and then that species will start spreading it within its own species. It can start mutating. And then before you know it, those workers within the wet markets, the ones that are picking up the animals and taking them back to slaughter them for the buyer, they're going to start picking up those viruses. That's kind of what happened with the current COVID-19. As I said, uh, wet market happened to be in China, but it could have been anywhere in the world. There's wet markets in New York, there's wet markets in Europe, um, Africa, South America, they're, they're very prevalent. Um, basically, they feel like this was a bat virus, a cold, a bat cold that somehow transferred to the pangolin. Now the pangolin is an innocent little, um, kind of like a small anteater from Africa, some parts of Asia. However, it's valued for its medicinal purposes and for its meat. So those getting imported into China, put in a cage, plopped down next to the local bats, we saw this virus transmission and here we are. So the two causes that we're addressing is habitat destruction that force, forces animals together, increases the transmission of zoonotic diseases, and animal agriculture, whether that's a wet market or whether that's an American CAFO, commercial animal farming operation, that are squeezing um, both um, farmed animals and wild animals into a very tight space. Basically, it's like creating a Petri dish. So all these viruses can move around and mutate and intermingle. Longer and intermingle, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So in warming, what effect does that have on well, agriculture? Warming, yeah. Now this this is a uh, now this is a, a case where pandemics and viruses are being directly impacted by climate change. You know, earlier I said that they have the same causes. They don't really, you know, they're not they're not cause and effect. But in this case, global warming is a cause and effect. Climate change is creating the global warming, or climate change and global warming. Basically, the production of greenhouse gases is causing global warming that leads to climate change. But that global warming is also changing the native habitats. So we talked about those um, emerging viruses, viruses that have lived in the rainforest and been stable and non-threatening to the rest of the world. Um, because temperatures are going up, those species are migrating toward the poles. So animals that normally would have never lived outside the tropic zone are now seeing further north and further south. And obviously they're bringing their cold and flu viruses with them. So they're, those viruses are moving out of their native habitats. They're emerging. And as they emerge, they can start infecting other species and humans. So, and I know you know a little bit about the pandemic of 1918. Um, how does that pandemic compare with this? Well, uh, 1918, um, the, the influenza, it's also called the Spanish flu for various reasons. Um, that was a pandemic that actually originated near Hayes, yeah. Kansas. That was a, a chicken pig farm, a farmer um, that, um, was a flu virus, influenza. So that flu virus was originally a, a bird flu, fairly benign, but it transferred to the swine on the farm. From the swine, it transferred to the farm worker, who 1918, World War I, uh, apparently some of the farm workers were then being shipped off to, to fight in the war. And Fort Riley, which was a staging area for people leaving for Europe, um, they got hit hard. That was one of the first places that saw this pandemic. And they started with uh, a report of one person coming in sick. And by the end of that day, they had several hundred people in the infirmary um, reporting that fever and flu-like symptoms. From there, shipped to Europe. Um, obviously, the trench warfare, just the perfect environment for it to spread. The, the um, 1918 actually infected 500 million people worldwide, and it killed 50 million people. So that was a 10% death rate. So um, uh, uh, Dr. Robert Hicks from the College of Physicians, um, he said, uh, somebody asked him, what lessons did they learn from the 1918 pandemic? And he said that the political, the, the politicians, the po popular people, the, the people and the science have to be in alignment for, to come out of a pandemic 
um, with the least amount of deaths. How do you agree with that trajectory? And if so, how are we doing with the current pandemic? Um, uh, yeah, I do tend to agree with that. I hadn't heard that quote before, but that, that makes sense. I mean, our, our, the people that are running our government, and uh, you know, they need to embrace science and work together to stop a pandemic like this. Um, yeah. Does not often happen. If we, we harken back to the 1918 flu pandemic again, that's often called the Spanish flu. And you may ask why. It didn't start in Spain. It started here in Kansas. And it, um, well, the fact is it became known as the Spanish flu because Spain was the only government whose press was reporting um, this. I lost sound. Can you still hear? Am I there? Are we okay now? Okay. And okay. Bob, we've yeah. got about one minute left. And, okay. um, uh, how can our listeners contact the Climate Council, and do you have any final thoughts? Uh, sure. This was a, a, a lot of area to cover in 18 minutes, so thank you so much. You, you did very well. Okay, thank you. It certainly is. Um, you can reach the Climate Council at our website, and that's climategkc, greater Kansas City, dot org, climategkc.org. Um, the pandemic we're fighting is has a lot in common with um, climate and you know if we solve the climate crisis we'll see much fewer of these pandemics and you know um, what you just mentioned a few minutes ago about science and politics and our our leaders our social popular leaders we all need to work together to make this happen and you couldn't have said it better because that's exactly what the Director General of the World Health Organization said to the media on March 16th, the amazing spirit, spirit of human solidarity must become even more infectious than the virus itself. We're all in this together and we can only succeed together. So the rule of the game is together. Thanks so much, Bob. Thank you, Chris.